So hello, everybody. Thanks for coming. Um, conscious it's getting towards the end now, so uh, yeah, appreciate it, and uh, good to see a good turnout. Um, my name's Charlie. I work on the developer relations team at Styra and on the OPA project. Uh, I split my time between working as an open source maintainer and doing things like this, where I come to events and meet all you lovely people. Um, yeah, now let Sertac introduce himself. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Sertac. I work at Microsoft. I'm an engineer manager there, and then I'm an OPA maintainer. So the agenda for today's session is I'm going to give a short overview of the OPA project and then go into uh, a little bit, little bit more detail about some recent updates that have happened in the project since maybe you last watched a talk like this. Um, and then Sertac's going to give an update about what's happening on the gatekeeper side for Kubernetes admission. So if you're not familiar with the OPA project, you may have seen the logo before in the CNCF landscape. Uh, OPA is a graduated um, CNCF graduated project. And the idea is that OPA is a domain agnostic general purpose uh, policy engine, which you can use for a variety of different policy use cases. So the intention is that you can decouple policy evaluation from uh, where you may be enforcing that policy. For example, you might have applications enforcing what users can do, um, make, make, making changes to a particular state and so on. You may have Kubernetes admins making changes in different clusters, different environments, different namespaces. Um, you also may have automated processes updating clusters or uh, making changes to infrastructure as code stacks. Um, and, and any of these different places, in addition to just controlling the messages between services in your infrastructure, um, are, are places where you may want to enforce policy. And OPA is there as a general purpose policy engine to run policy in all of those different places. So in a little bit more detail technically, um, this is how I like to think of OPA. OPA is a combination of a few different components. Crucially, it's a domain-specific policy language called Rego. Uh, this is the language of OPA. If you're writing policies for OPA, you're writing them in Rego. Um, and I'll give a brief overview of a Rego policy in a second. Um, OPA is also a policy server where you can run a long-running policy server, um, perhaps next to your application or in a number of different uh, architectures, I suppose, um, in order to perform policy evaluation. Um, but it also has functionality to reload policy and log policy decisions as they are happening. And that's the most common way that people use OPA today. Uh, we also have language SDK, so you can build OPA into Go applications natively. Uh, and we have WebAssembly modules, so it's possible to compile Rego to WebAssembly and run OPA within applications that way too. You bring that together with projects like Gatekeeper for Kubernetes admission and ConfTest for working with configuration files, uh, running policy over configuration files, and you bring that all together with the community and you get OPA and the OPA project. So this is just a little example of a policy um, that uh, I'm showing in the playground. The idea is that uh, you can create rules and based on the input or based on the data which is provided to the policy, uh, the decision is made by OPA and returned as the, as the output. So here we've got an example where we're allowing an admin um, but not allowing anybody else defaulting to false. So in a distributed system, this is how a uh, typical architecture might look. You have some business application which is making a call. It may provide information about a request that it's just received to OPA. Um, OPA then receives that request and so it runs and runs some policy, performs a policy evaluation. It will do this using the policy which it has loaded into it at that time, in addition to any additional data that's been loaded in. For example, in, a, in this example, it might, be, might commonly be some information that describes what users and their roles are allowed to do. So bringing that together, the policy rules, the data, and the information about the request, uh, it makes a decision and returns that to the business application to enforce the decision. So OPA is the policy decision point, and the application is the policy enforcement point. And this is a, a very similar example of how you could, how you could uh, use OPA within an application to have much the same effect where a particular part, perhaps some module um, that's uh, responsible for serving web requests makes a function call to an authorization module in the same program, uh, which is based on OSA, based on OPA, uh, and you can also use external data and or additional data 
and policy uh, that's been loaded into that module in much the same way. So what are some common policy enforcement points? We've been talking about OPA, the policy decision point. Um, your application is a very common policy enforcement point. You're receiving requests and you're trying to work out whether or not a request is allowed uh, or, or what message should be displayed if it isn't and so on. Um, that's, a, that's a particular, uh, particularly common policy enforcement point. The Kubernetes API server, um, Setek's so going to talk about the Gatekeeper project, which is a native OPA integration for working with the Kubernetes admission control integration. Uh, this is another, we are at KubeCon after all, this is another important uh, policy enforcement point for, for a lot of people here, I'm sure. So um, you've also got ConfTest. Uh, this is a, a common tool that people use in CI CD pipelines uh, to, to run uh, policy against changes to Terraform stacks or, or other standard configuration files. Uh, and the Envoy proxy, we have a native integration for that too, if you're using, using that. Just a quick update on some community milestones and, and uh, stats from, from last, last year, KubeCon North America. Uh, we've had contributions from 26 contributors from 26 new, company, new companies. Uh, we've had over 1,300 people join the OPA Slack. The OPA Slack is our main channel of community support and discussion. Uh, the QR code at the bottom of the screen takes you to the sign-up page if you're interested. Um, on average, each week, two new repos are uh, shared on GitHub, which contain Rego source code. Um, and we've also, in the OPA Core project at least, merged over 570 PRs, uh, and that's not including the pull requests merged to other projects in the OPA. Um, community. So I'm going to dig into a little bit more detail now about some ch recent changes to OPA, the language and the functionalities of the OPA server. So, but first just a, a public service announcement. Uh, we're no longer going to be publishing the rootless flavor of OPA images uh, for the next release. The current release is 0.58. Uh, this is the, the last release that will feature this, this flavor. So if you are, and if you are in particular using latest, um, latest dash rootless, you should just switch to, well, perhaps you should switch to a versioned uh, OPA image, but um, crucially, you, you will no longer be getting updates on that channel. So yeah, please, um, we, we are now, all of the OPA images are not using a root user, so um, you should feel confident to use one of the, um, the standard flavors instead. So we release once, uh, release OPA once a month at the end of the month. Uh, I last gave a maintainer update in Amsterdam. Uh, that was when we were on 0.52, we're now on 0.58. Um, so I'm gonna give a summary of the updates since that, since that point, uh, including a, a one update that um, happened uh, before, which uh, the North American audience may have, may have missed out on. Starting with some updates to the Rego language. Uh, we, we have two new features I'm gonna talk about today. We've got support for what we call general references and rule heads, which is perhaps a bit of a mouthful, but I'll try and explain why it's useful in a moment. Uh, we also now support the default keyword. Uh, I don't know if you remember in the example I showed earlier, we had default allow uh, false, that was with a rule. Uh, we now support that same keyword for functions too. Um, I was going to click the link and show it in the playground, but we've got a bit of a system with the screens going on, so I'm going to try and explain it instead. Um, the idea here is that uh, what, when we're talking about a general reference, a general reference is a token which has got uh, multiple variables in, contained within it. Uh, so this rule, which I don't think you can see my cursor, unfortunately, but the users by role rule, um, has got role and ID are both variables, things which are unknown um, prior to evaluation. And what this allows you to do in this example is uh, restructure what is a list of users uh, as a sort of nested structure of objects, uh, grouping users uh, by their role and ID. And this is something that was previously quite difficult to write in Rego, so this is a cool new feature. Um, we've also, as I mentioned, we've got the default keyword. Um, this, I was going to uh, show a little uh, example, but uh, hopefully you can see how it would have worked. The idea is that we can define default outputs for functions as well. So uh, by default, someone's nearest KubeCon is KubeCon North America. Um, but if the user's city is in Paris, then they get 
Uh, they get shown, they get shown the uh, KubeCon EU as being their nearest KubeCon. Um, if their time zone offset is within a particular range, they get shown North America. And if they are on a different planet or celestial body, then by default, we show them KubeCon North America. So we've also made uh, some updates to Rego's built-in functions. Uh, we have a wide collection, wide range of built-in functions to make writing policies easier. So the functions are focused on things that people tend to be writing policy about. So a lot of security, um, uh, security related functions. Uh, the HTTP send function is a function which you can use to call external systems uh, in a Rego policy. We usually recommend that people try and bring the data to OPA to make um, uh, to make the policy evaluation faster. But if you must call an external system as part of your policy evaluation, we've made a change to this function, which now allows you to uh, exponentially back off while using it. Um, the numbers range step function um, is useful for generating ranges of numbers with particular increments. Uh, this is useful to sometimes iterate over um, a collection of different cases or iterate through different data structures. I won't go into all the details on all of them, but um, we also have crypto HMAC equal, which is for securely comparing hashes, and JSON verify schema and match schema, uh, which are the two, which they're, they're older than the last six months, but I thought I would uh, remind the North American audience of them as well while we're here, um, which are useful for doing runtime, or doing JSON schema validation at runtime. So um, again, this was gonna be a little demo, but hopefully you can spot it. Uh, the idea here is, I don't know if anybody can spot the mistake in this policy. Uh, the input is on the right, the input that's been provided to the policy, and uh, on the left is the policy that's defined. At the moment, allow will be set, we, maybe we find that allow is true when we were expecting it to be false. Uh, we're providing an example email. I don't know if anybody can spot the mistake in the policy. I had a hand over here. Yeah, that's exactly right. So um, it's some data that looks mostly correct, but actually um, because the data that's been provided isn't in the expected format, in this case we would allow a request through um, that, that we didn't expect to. Um, you can, I won't click the link because I can't see the screen, but um, and to, to show you correctly, but there, the JSON match schema function is a good way to make sure that the data that you're operating on in one of your rules is actually as you expect. So uh, a few other features that are in the OPA that we've added to the OPA server. We've added support for open, telem open telemetry trace and span IDs in, in decision logs. So uh, decision logs are what we uh, call, I suppose, our audit, audit logging of policy evaluations. As policy evaluations are happening, you can collect uh, decision logs and send them to an, an additional external service. Uh, we support open telemetry trace and span IDs if that's something that you're using. Uh, we also now support the setting of a decision ID in the OPA SDK, that's the OPA Go SDK, which is the recommended way to use OPA within a Go application. Uh, and it's also possible to drop dis certain decision logs based on a Rego policy, as you may have expected. OPA test now supports watching for changes in files. So if you're editing files, uh, editing tests, uh, OPA, can, OPA test can now automatically rerun your tests as you're working on them. This is great for um, developer workflow. And we also support the schema flag, uh, which is something that's been available in OPA run for some time, but it's now in OPA test as well. We've added uh, or improved the output from, open, from the profiler uh, to show generated expressions. Uh, sometimes rules can generate uh, more expressions or, or, or be working under the hood in ways that people don't expect. So this is useful for uh, debugging in those cases. And we have a new authentication method for the OCI bundle downloader too. Another shout out to the rootless images. This is the end, we've been talking about this for quite some time. This is the end of the rootless uh, flavor of the images. Um, say goodbye and please update. Um, so yeah, getting to the end of my section now. If you're using OPA, we'd really love to hear about it. We hear from users all the time, um, and, but it, it's great to show, showcase the users the, and what, how, how they're using OPA. OPA is general purpose. Uh, it's really exciting to, to hear about all the different use cases that people 
uh, are applying OPA in. So we have this, this file in the OPA re main OPA repo called adopters. If you're using OPA, please feel free to open a pull request and myself or uh, one of the others will review it and we'll get that merged in. Now that would be really great. If you're building on OPA, if you have a product or open source project which is based on OPA, using OPA in some way or features some OPA integration, uh, we've been doing a lot of work on the OPA, what we call the OPA ecosystem page on the website recently, where we're trying to group different integrations based on OPA together uh, so that we can showcase, I suppose, all of the different use cases where people have applied OPA. So um, yeah, go check that out. It's, it's been updated in the last a couple of months and if you've got something where you're using it within one of your products or you have a even if it's a side project uh, please do get in touch we'd love to hear all about it and finally um, at Styra where I where I work we've been working on a lint for Rego uh, so yeah, I work in developer relations it's important to us that new users in particular have uh, have a good experience when they get started with OPA and uh, this is one way that we are, are trying quite hard to help users before they even ask for help. So um, in, in the playground, we now feature the linter output. Uh, so that's the easiest way to try out the linter, but, but do, if you have uh, Rego files in, in some of your repos, do run um, Regal there as well. And we've got a GitHub action integration out of the box, but it's a relatively simple program to install and to use as well. Um, so yeah. Um, one final update, uh, we're over the next few, few months hoping to share uh, a document about OPA v1 and the changes that will be coming in OPA v1 um, with the community for feedback. The, the focus of the document will be around the changes to adopting modern Rego uh, and, and what that will mean for existing policies and existing policy authors. Um, please stay tuned to the different OPA channels if this is something that's uh, important to you. Um, I was hoping to share it, but uh, it should be coming quite soon for feedback. Um, and we are targeting a V1 OPA in 2024. So yeah, um, but we're at KubeCon after all. Uh, so let's talk about OPA in the context of Kubernetes and mission control. And I'm gonna hand over to Sertak to cover that section. Thank you. So for those that are not familiar, Gatekeeper is a customizable Kubernetes admission repo. Uh, that helps enforce policies and strengthen governance. Uh, so uh, here I'm going to talk briefly about what Gatekeeper does, and then we're going to talk about what are, have been the major updates since last KubeCon and since last 3.13.x. Uh, you might already be using Gatekeeper and you might not uh, know about it. Uh, we have uh, official uh, integrations with managed services like Google, Google Kubernetes Engine or Azure Policy for Kubernetes. And then we have uh, other integrations with some of uh, uh, the other companies. And uh, if you have a managed service or an integ integration that you would like to feature at our website, uh, we would uh, welcome to open a PR and add your service or integration there. So let's talk about gatekeeper motivations. Um, if your organization has been operating Kubernetes, uh, you probably have been looking uh, for ways to control what end users can do on the cluster. Uh, and then these uh, policies may be there for uh, governance or legal requirements, or they, it could be for uh, best practices or organizational uh, conventions. Uh, often the, the need for a policy uh, comes into play uh, after uh, the cluster or workloads are in production already and it is very dangerous to uh, introduce something that is in a production environment and which can uh, bring your workloads down or bring your entire service down. So how do we help ensure uh, conformance without sacrificing agility and autonomy? Uh, so Gatekeeper um, uh, solves these in a, in a few ways. So uh, first is a, a policy as code. Uh, so in Gatekeeper, policy is defined as, as Rego, um, or, or sell in, in the future. We'll, we'll, we'll talk about that in, in a bit later. And Gatekeeper provides uh, a validating admission webhook uh, to uh, make sure the uh, Kubernetes admission requests are denied or, or get warned. And Gatekeeper provides a mutating admission webhook uh, so you can uh, either default to uh, for security reasons or organizational conventions or however you want. And then uh, 
this is coming back to the preview, the effects of a policy change. So uh, Gatekeeper provides an audit functionality so you can preview the, the effects of the, the policies before rolling out uh, as like in, in a de deny uh, mode. Uh, so you can see what would happen if you were to roll, roll these policies out. And Gatekeeper does this recurringly in, in the background. And Gatekeeper uh, also provides a CLI uh, for shiftless validation. Uh, and then this CLI is what we call Gator. Um, so in, in this case, you can um, validate your uh, policies uh, in your CI, even without the Kubernetes API server. Uh, Gatekeeper provides an external data functionality. Uh, this external data functionality is used for uh, communicating with external services. Uh, an example would be uh, is a container uh, registry, for, uh, for example. And then you can think of it uh, something like a container uh, image signing. So how do you verify that then every image is signed? Uh, last but not least, uh, Gatekeeper provides a community policy library uh, where you can get started right away with, uh, with uh, policies contributed uh, from the community. Uh, these are things like the pod security columns or, 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 or many more. And for the co uh, community policy library, uh, here are uh, our URLs. Um, so you can either find it on our website or in Artifact Hub. Uh, and then this is an example of a, a policy, library policy, uh, where this is a mitigation for a CVE. Uh, and then you should be able to get started right away using the policy library. Or if you are interested in modifying in any way or contributing, uh, please, you're also welcome to do so. Uh, let's switch gears to project updates. Uh, so since last KubeCon, we had two releases, 3.13 and 14. So some of the not notable updates are, uh, we improved our uh, multi-engine support with experimental validating admission policy uh, driver with uh, common expression language, uh, which is cell. We added uh, PubSub uh, support uh, for audit, uh, which eliminates the HCD size uh, li limitation for larger number of limitations. Uh, so this, and so by default, that CD uh, has a 1.5 megabytes uh, limit per object in, in a Kubernetes cluster. Uh, so if you have a cluster that have a larger uh, number of violations, uh, you will hit this limit because you can only store so much in a Kubernetes object. Um, expansion template that validate workload resources has graduated to beta. And then workload resources are things like uh, deployments or stateful sets. And we added uh, support for external data provider audit and validating web of cache. And uh, observability statistics for uh, admission uh, audit in Gator CLI are now available. And last but not least, we added support for uh, OPA 0.57.1 in our last release. So I mentioned um, uh, multi-engine support uh, in the, as part of the notable updates. Let's dig deeper uh, a little bit on this one. Uh, so as of Kubernetes 1.28, uh, the validation admission policy, uh, which is based on cell, is, an, is a beta feature for Kubernetes. It is a declarative in-process alternative to the validating admission webhooks. So uh, we were talking about gatekeeper and validating policy admission, like when do we use what? So validating admission policy, which short is GAP, uh, WAP, uh, it's an in tree uh, native in-process. So it is in tree for Kubernetes. Uh, it reduces the admission request latency because it removes the hop to, to, the, uh, to, to the webhook. It improves reliability and availability because uh, of this change because it, it is in tree. And it is able to be fail closed without impacting availability. And then this, this comes back to the uh, removing the hop because what happens if the, the, the webhook service is down. And reduces operation uh, burdens of webhooks because you don't have an extra webhook to worry about. Uh, it uses the common expression language, cell. And let's talk about uh, Gatekeeper. 
So Gatekeeper provides an audit functionality we just uh, talked about earlier, which previews the effects of uh, the, uh, the, your, your policies. Gatekeeper provides a ability to uh, use referential policies, and you can think of it as uh, checking for uniqueness. For example, unique ingress names. So for objects that already e exist in the cluster where you want to compare any policies to. Uh, and we talked about external data functionality for querying external data sources such as container registries. Uh, mutation. Uh, shift left validation with our CLI. So you can uh, make sure to shift left validation so you can uh, uh, validate your policies. And uh, Gatekeeper provides uh, complex rules that Cell may not be ha handled today with, with Raga. And uh, we, we also just talked about the community policy library. And then uh, since uh, its beginning, uh, Gatekeeper has been designed with multi-engine and multi-language um, in, in mind. Uh, so it su can support OPA and more or Rago and more. So uh, we just talked about different things, but is there a way to get best of both worlds? So um, as I mentioned earlier, Gatekeeper has been designed with multi-engine in mind from the start. This is why we created this project called Constraint Framework, which provides an abstraction layer um, uh, so constraint framework is multi-language and multi-target enforcement. The in language could be like Rego, Cell, or others in the future. And then targets could be Kubernetes admission, could be Terraform, or, or others. And then this is what provides the core uh, constraint template and constraint uh, functionality for Gatekeeper today. Uh, and then recently we added uh, the cell in uh, the, the support for validation admission policy to the uh, constraint framework, uh, and then we are continuing to improve on this. So together with uh, Gatekeeper and the Gator CLI, uh, so uh, the, you, you as users can get audit and shift left validation for uh, validating admission policy for free. Uh, and then this is available uh, with an experimental flag uh, in Gatekeeper 3.14 today, and then in any feedback is welcome. And then uh, there's a uh, flag to enable the support. So uh, we just talked about all this stuff, but let's look at this like graphically and how, how this might work, right? So, so if an admission request comes into a Kubernetes API server, uh, say this is like a validating admission policy, uh, it can go to, it, it go to val validation, uh, validating admission policy admission controller, and then depending on the, the binding and the policy, validating admission policy, it will be executed. Or it can go to uh, validate ad admission webhooks, such as Gatekeeper, and then uh, inside Gatekeeper, Gatekeeper will query OPA, and then the, uh, based on the constraint and then the constraint template, uh, it will be, the policy will be executed in the end. Uh, so for future, uh, we're thinking Gatekeeper as front-end for Kubernetes policies. Uh, so you still have the constraint templates and then constraints, but uh, the one difference here is the engine. So if you uh, notice in the engine, we have Kate's native validation or the, 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 the OPA slash Rego uh, engine. So depending on the, the engine type, and then the Gatekeeper controller will decide uh, if it is uh, if it's Kate, Kate's native validation or, or OPA validation. And then depending on the, the Kubernetes version, uh, it'll either create the validating admission policy, so it'll be executed with the, the entry um, the validating admission policy engine inside Kubernetes, or if, if the Kubernetes version is older and does not support validating admission policy, it'll go through uh, Gatekeeper, and then Gatekeeper will, uh, be, uh, will, will execute the validating admission policy and then the, the cell uh, because Gatekeeper imports the Kubernetes libraries that can, 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 can interpret and execute this policy. So and, and this, this works similarly for audit. So if you have a um, constraint template with OPA slash Rego, it'll use the, the OPA driver. And if you have a uh, uh, engine case native validation, it'll use the case native validation driver inside Gatekeeper. So let's look at a, um, a demo. So in this case, uh, we're gonna 
show a uh, quick demo where we use uh, Dapper Runtime in a PubSub broker. And in this case, we're gonna use Redis, but uh, Dapper supports many other brokers, so you're not limited to, um, to, to Redis. So we're gonna have two constraint templates. So one of them is gonna use the Kate's native validation, um, and then the other one is going to use the, the Rego engine. And then we're going to get the uh, Gatekeeper audit results and uh, publish to, uh, to our PubSub pub broker. Uh, is it? Let me uh, move so I cannot <laughs> see it over there. <laughs> All right. So, um, so if you're familiar with a constraint template, this looks similar, but the difference is uh, this is this is using the cell expressions instead of rego. So we are going to deploy our um, uh, uh, cell-based constraint template and and cell-based cons uh, just this re uh, regular constraint. And then this is another policy. This is this uses rego. So. Uh, so in this demo, we're gonna see side-by-side -side cell and rego policies uh, executed by Gatekeeper in an older Kubernetes version that does not support validating admission policy by default. So this is, a, I believe this was a kind 1.27 cluster. Um, and then this is like how you would get the constraint violations today for a cell policy. There are no changes as far as like the user facing. Uh, you'll, you'll still get, get the audit results. And then this is a new feature we added uh, for uh, PubSub. So you'll be able to uh, subscribe to the audit logs and then, um, and then re retrieve them. And then in this way, you don't get uh, limited by the HCD object size. So you, if you have a lot of violations, like 10,000 violations, whatever, you, you'll be able to see all of them. Uh, and then you, you'll get both cell and and, and Drago violations, obviously. Okay, I'm gonna go back up. <laughs> okay, and then final shout out to ConfTest, uh, which is an open project to run Rego um, on structured configuration data, uh, and uh, they added support for uh, Azure DevOps in their latest update. And then thank you for all, all the contributors. Um, and then if you are interested on in joining the community, uh, here are some of the URLs and a uh, Slack sign up uh, QR code. Uh, please re reach out anytime, um, connected, um, and then feedback is, is welcome. Uh, so yeah, let us know. Thanks. I'm just gonna pop it over to the... Um, I think we have a very short amount of time for questions. Mm -hmm. Um, we are going to be in the project pavilion, uh, or at least I will be from 1 until 2.30 when it closes today. Uh, if you have any burning OPA questions, please uh, come by and say hi and ask them then. Otherwise, the Slack, the OPA Slack is the best way to get in touch with us. Um, that's the QR code again uh, if you did miss it. Uh, we're here at KubeCon, keen, keen to chat to new people new OPA users in, in particular and make sure we get them off on the, in the right direction. So uh, yeah, I think um, any questions and queries, please do come by the kiosk and, uh, and say hi. I'll, I'm gonna go grab my lunch and then I'll be back there about one o'clock. So uh, maybe see you there. Thanks very much. <laughs>